Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and I want to begin by reading the last eight verses of the third chapter of Ephesians. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The first word of the third chapter of First John is Behold. So if you'll turn with me to the third chapter of First John, we're going to do some beholding. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, thankful, beyond words, which beyond what words can express for the love that you've given us, each and every one of us, your children. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're studying together in the uh, first epistle of John, and in our last study together, we finished chapter 2. And so we begin now with uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, and I pointed out that there are many who believe the chapter division should have occurred at the end of verse 28, so that verse 29 would actually be the first verse of chapter 3, if, if you find that odd or strange. Uh, uh, just know that many scholars take that position. It's, it's, uh, they take that because of the apparent change in subject. And there, there were no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts. And I talked about that a little bit in the last video. If you know perfect knowledge that God is righteous, then you know experiential knowledge that everyone doing righteousness has been born of him, has been begotten of him. They're not born of him because they do righteousness. They're not born of him because of anything that they did. It's a passive voice. Because they were born by the will of God, the word of God, uh, the spirit of God, they do righteousness. And it's with that thought in mind that we come to verse 1 of chapter 3. Take a look at, behold, what kind of love or what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. And it's almost impossible to describe that love. Uh, I don't mind admitting that I feel quite inadequate uh, in describing the extent of that love. And all I have is the text, dearly beloved, to, to work with, so bear with me here. It's, it's just immense. The, the Holy Spirit mentioned this in Romans. While, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. While we were his enemies, when we were not seeking him, uh, when we were not working for him, in fact, when we were hostile to him, okay, and it was in that condition that he's bestowed his love. 
upon us. And somehow we have to get our minds in the power of this verse. There are many Christians, multitudes of Christians who don't think God loves them very much. When the marvelous testimony to the love of God is that he bestowed his love on us and he did so when we were in that condition. A love that's as far above our, our, our concept of love as the heavens are above the earth when we didn't love him, when we were not seeking him, when we didn't care for him. He loved us. And the text says that he bestowed that on us. And it's a perfect tense. He didn't bestow it because you asked. He didn't bestow it because you deserved it. He didn't bestow it because of anything in you. He bestowed his love on you because you were his child. Which reminds us of the 8th chapter of Romans. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conformed to the image of his son. That's how he predestinated them. They, they aren't going to make themselves conformed to the image of his son. He predestined them conformed to the image of his son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, and, and that word justified is made righteous, he glorified. He did that. God did that. You know, the idea that you're going to uh, sanctify yourself and become more and more holy or, or you know, you better do that or you're going to fall away. You know, it's all up to you. That is, folks, that is a cleverly devised fable. There is no scripture to support such a thing. There isn't the slightest indication in this verse that God bestowed his love on you because of anything you did. Modern evangelism puts it all on the part of the individual. Virtually none of it on the part of God. God did all he could. The rest is up to you. There's never been anything up to you. God bestowed his love on you. A love that is so incomprehensible that the text says, dearly beloved, it is so incomprehensible that the text says, stop, take a look at this love. Behold. Okay. What manner? Take a look at this love. And that love is continuous. It's there when you hurt. It's there when this or that or the other thing falls apart in your life. His love never changes. Yours, yours does, but His never changes. Your emotional love goes up and down like, you know, with the weather. <laughs> God's never changes. It, it's not only an amazing and, and an astounding love, it's an enduring and unchanging love that we are called God's children. You see, the, the, the two thoughts are connected, okay? That we are His children. Technon. Now, the authorized version has the word sons, and it's not even there in the majority text. All of the evidence is that we are God's children. You know, the word son here could carry, uh, would, would carry with it the, impl the idea that, the, an idea of maturity in adulthood, but what this verse is talking about, folks, is childhood. The manner of love that God has bestowed upon us, He's bestowed it. That's done. And there isn't anything that any human's going to do to change that fact. I can't possibly say to you, that if you'll do this or that or the other thing, God will bestow his love on you. That is not true. He has bestowed his love on us. That we would be called his children. It's, it's another one of our identities. We are God's children. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. It's astounding to me the number of Christians who are concerned about sin. Oh, little children, your sins are completely forgiven. He's forgiven you all trespasses. He's forgiven you all sin. It's done. That's why you're not under any guilt of sin. We are his little children. The context of the verse is not 
uh, to in any way give you the idea that you're a responsible party in this. You are a recipient, okay? The re responsible party is God. And it, it is a love that is so perfect that God would take one who hates him, one who's his enemy, one who's not seeking him, one who's not doing good, and bestow that love perfectly upon him. Perfect tense. He did it in past time. It's completely done, and we're stressing the present reality of that action. That's grace, folks, okay? And so we are called. My Bible says that we should be called. My Greek text says we are called God's children. It isn't that we should be. The actual fact is that, is that we are called God's children. We are called God's children because of that love. The world doesn't know us because it knew him not. And once again, we have to deal with that word world. The world does not mean everybody. We can't say that everybody in the world hates us. Everybody that ever lived hates us. That's not true. That's not what the word world means. It is the world religious system which hates us. Dearly beloved, if you are absolutely faithful to this book, even in, in what we call the, the Christian system, you are virtually an outcast. The offense of the cross is simply that we are un, unable to do anything for ourselves spiritually. You know, we sing Jesus paid it all, but we don't live that way. The religious system doesn't know us because it doesn't know Him. That was true in Christ's day. You know, and the Jewish religious system, which, which should have been the one that, that spoke for God. And in the same way, we ought to be able to look at our theological experts to understand the meaning of the text, and in the great majority of cases, that is not true. The world religious system doesn't know God. And folks, that is a terrible charge. There's an old book that, on the sovereignty of God that was written back in the 1600s. I can't remember the name of the author. It was 1600. 16 something and it was arguing the point that the christian system has gone pelagian and that was 400 years ago but but i believe that's always been true it was true in christ's day he called some of the scribes and the pharisees you know uh, leaders in the religious system he called them the sons of the devil we know Satan masquerades as ministers, as ministers of light. Dearly beloved, we don't have good Christians, mediocre Christians, and poor Christians, okay? That is a cleverly devised fable. That's a flat-out lie. What we have are saints, okay, who don't always act like saints, even when they know they're a saint, which few seem to know today. Uh, you can find fantastic self-help how-to books for those of you who are carnal and, and those of you who are spiritual. But I seriously, seriously doubt that they mention that you're a saint. And so we've got, you know, some for whom Christ did a good job and some he did a mediocre job and, and some he did a very poor job. So not all of us will go to heaven. Or, or some of us may miss the rapture or who knows what. What kind of error creeps into all that mess? And so we really have sort of a fractured body of Christ because Christ didn't do a good job. Chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness has been born of him. Now what kind of child do you think God would have? You are born from above. John 1. 
You're born by the will of God, First Peter. You're born by the word of God. You're born by the spirit of God, but you're never born by you. So what kind of child do you think that God would beget? There's no sin in that new man. And when I say that, folks, I put myself at variance with the vast majority of modern Christianity. I do not believe that which is born of God can sin. Okay? There aren't those born of God who are, some, some are a little righteous and some not so righteous and, you know, it's, and we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. You have his genes. You are, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, behold, all things have become new. There's that word behold again. Behold, all things have become new. You were made the righteousness of God in Christ. If you followed us through Romans and Ephesians, you know that. Therefore, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Folks, these are marvelous, marvelous truths. They will not only strengthen you, but settle you and establish you in the faith. Verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Oh, we love to talk about how the fact that, uh, or at least most of us, most Christians love to talk about the fact that Christ Jesus knew no sin. He had no sin. He knew no sin. That, that God cannot sin. And, and yet, when we talk about us being begotten of Him with a new nature, where old things have passed away and all things have become new, now all of a sudden we see, we see ourselves as walking around as, as saints? No. We see ourselves as walking around as sinners. Folks, you've got to adjust your mindset here. None of, none of this book, not one word of this book, teaches such a concept as that. Yes, we do sin. We have sin. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But that's our old man, not our new man. Whosoever abideth remains in him, and we saw that we will remain in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. A person that doesn't have that new nature does not know him. That person's not born of God. Verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. We see the same thing mentioned again. The father sees you as righteous as his son. You stand before God. I stand before God as righteous as his son. Because we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. Verse 8, he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. That is not you. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, of course, the, the sinless new man born of God destroyed the works of the devil, or God did in creating that new man. We're talking about the works of the devil, who... Of course, the sinless new man, born of God, destroyed the works of the devil. Because, I mean, who was it who, that played a hefty part in seducing Adam and Eve to a place where that they had nothing but a sin nature? And, of course, you get down to the ninth verse. All who are born of God do not commit sin. And we have to get out of that somehow because, you know, because I'm... I just can't accept that. I can't believe that because I know that I sin. So that surely that's I'm not surely something's wrong here. I mean, 
Folks, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. The truth is not in us. If you don't think you have a sin nature, you make God a liar. You do have a sin nature, but you are also a new creation born of God. And that new creation is just like its father. That's how much God loves us. His little children were called God's children, born of incorruptible seed, his seed, saints by calling. And it is because of that, therefore, on that be on, because that is true, the religious system hates us. That's what I think that the world is, primarily, in the Word of God. Primarily, cosmos is, is the word there for world. Primarily, that's a religious system. The religious system knows him not because it knew him not it, it's inconceivable that we don't have to do something you know if, if we're going to go to heaven we got to earn it if it's worth having it's worth working for right you know it's, that's how we were raised that's the world we live in that's the system that we live under and so therefore we can't we have we have a hard time comprehending grace It knew him not. And the word not there is the absolute negative. Okay? You Greek students know that. It absolutely did not know him experientially. And that's the Holy Spirit telling you that God loves you. Dear friends, I don't care what's going on in your life. God knows. And he's given you a love that you can't even begin to fully comprehend. While you're walking around doubting that God loves you for whatever cockeyed reason, there are a great number of other Christians who are trying to, to comprehend the greatness of that love. He's given you a love that you can't begin to fully comprehend. He's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Please, please, folks, don't buy into the lie that he loves some more than others. I mean, are there Christians who act like the devil? Sure. But that doesn't change the truth of the new man. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. And I pointed, tried to point out in the last video that is, that is not, well, we won't continue or pra to, to practice sin. We don't practice sin. Like, you know, we're, before we received a, a new sinless nature, that's all we do. You know, we just practiced getting better at it and, you know, we couldn't sin enough and we couldn't get as good at, at sinning as we wanted to. It's not practice, it's do. We cannot do, the new man cannot do sin. And verse 10 says that in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. We are born of God. Our new man can't sin. We know him. Therefore, we love the brethren. But as we saw when we studied Romans, but I see, I see that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing, for it is not I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. The new man doesn't sin. Dearly beloved, no matter what the old man does. He's not going to change the validity of the new man. That's what you need to understand. Yeah, I do. I do think there are new creations in Christ Jesus who've lived a totally wasted life from a human standpoint. But I know a God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And when you get before God and you say, I tried my best. 
he might point to somebody over there and say, see that guy? Okay, he didn't do anything. But my grace is manifested in him. I don't know. I'm, I'm not God. Is he, is he speaking truth when he says, do all things, all things, without murmurings and disputing, for it's God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure? Or are those just words? If they're not true, then folks, I, don't ha I have nothing to preach. If they are true, I can rest in the power and the wisdom of a God who does all things well. And I can say with Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Could they have done anything else? Could his brothers have said, hey, this is not a good idea. Let's don't do this. Could they have done that? Absolutely not. Why? Because God ordained that. What they were doing was for good. It didn't look good to Joseph, but God meant it for good. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so will it be. As I have purposed, so will it stand. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and, and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Dearly beloved, rest in the greatness of our God. The world knows him not, but you are loved. You are children of God. You're his offspring. You're loved because you're his children. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, we absolutely know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect tense. We know he's going to appear. And when that happens, we shall all be like him because... I, if I were you, I would highlight the word because. Because we shall see him as he is. One God settled down permanently in the incarnation. Colossians chapter 2, for in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it is when we see him, that moment that we see him, that twinkling of an eye, okay, that we're going to be like him. And I wish I could tell you what that means. I can tell you what I think it means, but I, I don't. I don't think that I, I or anyone else has ever plumbed the depths of that statement. Second Corinthians three, verse eighteen. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, even as by the Spirit of the Lord transfigured into the same image. The verb is, is the same. Metamorphosis uh, in the Greek there is, uh, it's the same word as that's used in the account of our Lord's transfiguration. A metamorphosis of the Christian into the likeness of Christ. We see God mirrored in Christ who is the image of the invisible God. And as we gaze with our face unveiled on that mirror, a change comes over us. Christ, keep in mind, Christ is the Word of God. The image of this, this the old rotten sinful nature, the old Adamic nature, becomes less distinct, and the image of the new man after the likeness of Christ takes its place which is exactly what we are being pressed to consider. Okay? Here. The sinless new man cannot sin. In simple terms, the more we come to realize who he is, the more we come to realize who we are. If this text is stressing anything, folks, in my opinion, it is, it is that it seems to clearly indicate that it, it is all about seeing him. Okay? And I think that's true whether we're talking about seeing him in the word, seeing him in one another, or seeing him when he appears. 
You know, we are effectually changed. We are not changed when we look at in the Word and see our old and just, you know, our whole focus is not on Him, but it's on ourselves. Don't expect to be changed much, okay? There to be much change at all. But when we focus our attention on Him, when we set our affection on things above, I think we see a difference. And it's true that we preach the gospel to all men. I've had people ask me, Steve, if, if all of this election stuff is, if what you're saying is true, why preach the gospel? Folks, we preach the gospel to all men, but we do so knowing only his people will hear, which eliminates the need for personal decision. The, the real question here is what are we to preach? Because if we leave our listeners the false impression that it's they who must decide that they've got to do something to earn or merit God's unmerited favor, then we have not preached the gospel. We preached uh, some distortion of it that's, that's neither effectual or honorable to God. They need to know that God chose them, okay? You, you circumvent that glorious truth and you've essentially presented Christ as not having done enough. Are you really going to place your works next to the finished work of Christ in comparison? And look at, at your works as somehow that's what makes his work complete. Is that what you're going to do? Combining human works with a redemption that comes to his people by pure grace. We know his people will hear. We know his sheep will hear. He said so. The will of man, the will of the flesh in the matter becomes irrelevant. Okay? If you believe in Christ, it's because God decided to redeem you long before you saw you needed to be. Okay? That, that may come as a shock to some Christians, but it's true. Before you were born, God already loved you. Before you heard his name, your name was already in the Lamb's Book of Life. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless and loved before him. That's how we stand. That's how we are. Because of what he did, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved. Okay? Election means that before the events of Genesis 1 unfolded in, in actual time, God chose you in Christ. The Lamb's Book of Life was written, folks, before earth was established. This book contains the names of everyone who will be redeemed by Christ's blood. And in heaven right now, there is a page in the Lamb's Book of Life with your name on it. Okay, and your name is written in ink older than the dirt beneath your feet. That decision was made long before you took your first breath long before you committed your first sin or sang your first hymn, <clears throat> God knew that you would come to faith. God set your destination long before you could crawl, dearly beloved. Dearly beloved, I know that some of these things are, are tough in light of what the traditional teaching that's, that's permeated this institution of, of what we call Christianity for now well over four, 400 years at least. I have, it's, it has been not as much my, my, uh, my heart has not been as much that you would really uh, just to understand these things as it is that you would spend time in this book. That's where the problem is. 
If we don't spend time in this book, folks, we can't understand who Christ is. We can't understand who we are in him. He predestined you to be adopted into his family by the death and resurrection of Christ. He wasn't surprised when faith blossomed in your heart. He knew the day was coming. He planned it. And God's plan to save particular sinners for eternity was and is unconditional. No human factors were considered in God's election. No conditions outside of God playing a, a role in his choosing. Election was all according to the good pleasure of his will. This is what we need to tell. God's children. I love you all. I truly do. And I just, I hope and I pray that you are all well and safe. I ask for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.